Let's say you were a Roman politician in the year 65 AD. You finally come home exhausted from a Senate council meeting and you slowly sit down in your kitchen table with a much needed glass of wine. Raising your wine glass to your lips to take that first sip, your front door violently swings open and five heavily armored soldiers with their long swords drawn demand you come with them. With your wine untouched, you stand and follow the guards to a prison cell. Bewildered, you ask what's the meaning of this. One of the centurions says something about conspiracy against the emperor. Shocked, you back away from the guard and take a seat. Blankly staring at the ground, you realize the punishment for such a crime is death. Fast forward a few weeks, you're finally in your house with your wife. The emperor released you from prison only under one condition, however. You commit suicide with one of the guards watching to verify you've obeyed this command to completion. Your wife, who can't take living this world without you, also decides to commit suicide. You slash your veins, but all you feel is pain and anguish. A doctor slashes your ankles to make the blood flow more quickly, but still, nothing. You only feel even more pain and more screams come from your house servants and your wife. Screaming at the slaves, you tell them to take her away since you're having second thoughts. Minutes later, a slave takes it to another level and decides to hand you poison. Finally, with copious amounts of blood loss and poison, you die. Of all the historical figures of Stoicism, this death, namely the death of Lucius Aeneas Seneca, was one of the most prolonged, brutal deaths of all Roman Stoics. Obligated to commit suicide by one of the most sadistic emperors in history for trumped up charges of conspiracy, Seneca exited this life unfairly and harshly. And yet, as a Stoic, Seneca lived a life of rationality and peace of mind. If Stoicism could crudely be boiled down into a single sentence, it would have to be defined as practicing virtuous indifference in the face of hardship. Virtuous being defined as the following four principles, justice, moderation, courage, and wisdom. Of all the principles of Stoicism, however, one has helped me the most, the principle of wisdom. And among many other definitions, Stoic wisdom can be defined as pro-social rationality. Pro-social because it's not merely cold and calculated, but a net good for our fellow neighbors. One such practice of pro-social rationality is something I personally call emotive formal logic. Formal logic is defined as the following. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. If X is true and Y is true, then Z is true. But how can we use this powerful tool of logic for our desires and impulses? Let's say you're in bed and you wanted to reach for your phone. You know that going on your phone will make you sleep much later. But still, you just feel really drawn to using your phone and it might be causing distress trying to decide. Well, the Stoics will use the following emotive formal logic. I really want to reach for my phone. I really should try to sleep. Therefore, I feel distress deciding. X is true. Y is true. Z is true, right? Well, let's see. I really want to reach for my phone. This is true, right? Well, it's true in the sense that you want to, but you also want to go to sleep. So it's not true that you just want to reach for your phone. I really should try to go to sleep. This is true, right? Well, again, it's not true because you want to reach for your phone. I feel distressed trying to decide which action to take. At face value, you might say this is true because you feel this emotion. But if you think about it, is there anything inherent about your phone and sleep that should logically be causing you distress? Is it affecting your well-being and survival? Is there a biological hard-coded if-then statement which says, if phone plus sleep, then distress? False. You have logical control over all these factors. The Stoics would say you also have to make sense of the world around and within you. One of the most powerful tools in crowning achievements of rational thinking is something called inductive reasoning and deductive reason. You can think of inductive reasoning as starting with some small observation and making a hypothesis that is generalizable to all similar phenomena. For example, an infant sees the stove is hot. He puts his hand on the stove and gets burned. Now he can hypothesize by inductive reasoning that all stoves that are red can burn him if he touches them. Whether we know it or not, human beings and indeed infants are very skilled inductive reasoners. 
But what the Stoics understood about rationality and reasoning is that inductive and deductive reasoning can also be used to live a worry-free life. Epictetus, another prominent Stoic figure, regularly practiced inductive reasoning for virtuous living. An example is the following quote. Remember to tell yourself of what general nature things are, beginning from the most insignificant things. You are fond of a specific ceramic cup. Remind yourself that it is only ceramic cups in general of which you are fond. Then, if it breaks, you will not be disturbed. If you kiss your child or your wife, say that you only kiss things which are human, and thus you will not be disturbed if either of them dies. Notice the small to large observation of preparing for heartbreak. If he acknowledges that he loves this cup but can practice being okay when it breaks, surely he can similarly acknowledge that he loves his wife and child and can also be okay if they were to unfortunately pass away. Now what about deductive reasoning? observing a general phenomenon and making a hypothesis about a smaller, more specific instance. A good example is a quote from Seneca, just as it does no good to pour any amount of liquid into a vessel if there is nothing at the bottom to receive and keep it, so it makes no sense how much time we are given if there is nowhere for it to settle, and it's allowed to pass through the cracks and holes in the mind. Seneca deduces by analogy that a vessel without a bottom is the same as an individual who lets the moments of life pass through the cracks and holes of the mind. To be existentially formidable, we human beings have to realize that when we make sense of the world around us, we inevitably operate in the world as more secure and effective men and women. But you know, even though I say this, there was a time when I genuinely saw the utility in seeing the world through the lens of empathy and emotion instead of compassion and stoic rationality. I mean, if you really saw the world and all its injustices and horrors, wouldn't you yourself be changed? After all, it was Ralph Ellison who said knowledge brings fear. While the good news is, the Stoics already had a solution for this. The Stoics call this the discipline of ascent, and it concerns your thoughts about life. It emphasizes the initial idea of separating your initial knee-jerk thoughts from rational judgment. The Stoics discovered that to master your thinking, you have to master your initial impressions, and to master your initial impressions, you have to be disciplined about what thoughts you assent to, or what thoughts you accept. Let's say you hear a loud noise in your kitchen at 3 in the morning. Your immediate response would be to think that someone is in your kitchen and they may potentially harm you. But instead of accepting this thought, you tell yourself that crime in your neighborhood is rare at this time of night and that it's likely a sound from outside your house. And you can even take the discipline of ascent one step further in this example. You could still entertain the idea that an intruder really is in your home without entertaining the idea of distress. It's possible that you can defend yourself until the police arrive. Through the discipline of assent, your secondary, more revised response should be a more rational interpretation of the situation. And in a world where the internet is filled with outrage porn, advertising, social media, and countless shows and movies to watch, we find our rationality being crushed under the full weight of constant stimulation. Stimulation that makes it from our phones and TV screens into our thoughts and even our speech. Marcus Aurelius, second century emperor, noticed this hyperbolic speech even 1,700 years ago and said that there is nothing so conducive to greatness of mind as the ability to examine events rationally and view them realistically by stripping them down by their physical characteristics. Be alive today, especially in the Western world, with all its obvious flaws, is to be alive in the most wealthy, technologically advanced, and longest living population in the history of humanity. To be alive today is to be alive during a true human achievement. And yet, to be alive today with all these amazing things around us is not enough. The Stoics understood to be formidable is to give life a fighting chance. And if we are to give life a fighting chance, we have to control our impulses, we have to master our emotions, and we have to think more rationally and compassionately. Because it's possible that in a highly emotional world, we only have to practice rationality just a little bit to become a beacon of virtue for others. The point is, if we want to be more formidable, stoic rationality is the place to start. So start after watching this. And also, thank you 
for watching this.